Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this very important session. It is always a pleasure for the Bomb and Gilead to be a part of USCHA. Uh, and uh, we are excited to bring this session to you uh, today, Black Faith Response to Social Justice and Disparities. Black Faith Response to Social Justice and Disparities. We are excited. And I have three great panelists this, this morning, this afternoon. I'm not too sure what time of day it is, but wherever it is, it's a good day. Uh, Reverend Dr. Willie Francois, the senior pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church in Pleasantville, New Jersey. The Reverend Dr. Nathaniel Brooks, the senior pastor of Greater St. John, Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and my dear sister, Reverend Dr. Danielle Brown, pastor of Church Life at the Cathedral International in Prep Amboy, New Jersey. Welcome, panelists. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're going to uh, get right into this conversation. Uh, and the first question, I'm just going to open it up. We're going to have a robust conversation about the faith response to social justice and we, I don't know if we need to say anything about social justice because we are uh, in this time and space where uh, justice um, is at, a, I cannot say at a new height uh, because I grew up in the segregated South. Uh, and uh, to see that where we are, where we still are in this country, um, that, that really looks like where we were when I was growing up in Charleston, South Carolina, it's absolutely saddens my heart. Amazing, we've come so far and yet we are uh, stuck and sometimes I think we're going, uh, going backwards. So the first question I wanna throw out is, uh, with all this going on in our nation, COVID-19, racial injustice, unemployment, should faith communities be at the forefront of the conversation and how? Yeah, I know that we all know that, uh, especially in the black community, the faith leaders have taken that role as being at the front. But how in this, in this new context uh, and your new emerging voices, uh, we don't have Y.T. Walker on the phone, we, uh, on, the, on this call. We don't have Reverend Dr. Jim Forbes on this call. We don't have Canon Williams. We don't have all of the Jesse Jackson. We don't have those reverends, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. They have done their march and they're moving on or gone on. Young voices, emerging voices like yours, what should the faith community be about in this time? Uh, Sister Danielle Brown, Reverend Doctor, I'm going to hit it off to you, start the conversation. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity to share with these amazing panelists, uh, my brothers here. I, I think that it's important in this era for the faith community to really, really have a handle, or faith leaders, to know when to lead and when to follow. Um, you gave a litany of faith leaders who were at the forefront. Uh, if our faith leaders are not the creators and organizers of uh, particular movements, does not mean that the church is not involved, mm -hmm. right? I think that, that there is a, a time, this is now a time of also redefining what we mean by the priesthood of all believers. Uh, it, historically, we thought that if those names were not the ones at the front of the line, yeah. right, then, then it meant that the church was not at the forefront of those movements. Mm -hmm. This season is very different. It, the, the, at the forefront of these movements may be the people that we are pastoring and not we ourselves. And so we learn how to lead and develop leaders and then get behind them and allow them to run. Um, I think that it's important to know what your, your wheelhouse is. Uh, it's important to know uh, who you are in the moment, have your finger on the pulse of who you are and, and where you need to be. But we, as faith leaders, may not always be uh, at, at the front or, or most, the most visible in these movements um, just by nature of, of, of where we are, right? I, I think that, that there's been a whole lot of trying to duplicate what was. And, and while this movement is building on the strength and the progress of the civil rights movement and, and what that era of leaders um, did, it's not the same. And so I say, I think that it's important for us not to discredit the role of the church 
in these movements if our favorite preacher is not at the front of the line? I think that's so that's so great and and so uh, so important because you're absolutely right. If if Reverend Doctor So and So is not leading it, it's not validated. And I, I agree with you a thousand percent that uh, we are in a new air and it's the masses. And if you're a leader, you have to know how to lead and follow. I think that's good, Reverend Dr. Danielle. Uh, you know let's... What to do with your power. That's right. right. You have power and influence and maybe you're not the only one who's benefiting from it, but you use it to promote the ideas and the brilliance of, of some and anointing, right, of someone right. else. That's right. Dr. Francois, I'm going to send it over to you. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you for, for gathering us today. I think that it's important for churches to, uh, so, so I, I think one of the first moves churches must do, and that's actually have a theological revolution, right? Because I think that what makes churches so inert, what makes us so placid, uh, is that we have really been nurturing theologies uh, that, that are are prone uh, to lean people to passivity, lean people uh, to to living a, a sort of political non-engaged life or what Walter Fluker calls a political narcolepsy, right? And I think that the, the, the church has been, churches, right, have been violently asleep because of the way we have embraced an Americanized white Christ uh, over against this Palestinian carpenter. Uh, and so I think there has to be this reclamation of, of, of this radical Jesus uh, who confronted power, this radical Jesus who you used how his own power and privilege to live alongside those who were disinherited and had been uh, marginalized by the, by the religious structures of the day, but also the imperial structures of the day. And so I think that if our Jesus has been sanitized, uh, then that actually leads to a more politically inert, politically asleep church. So the first thing we have to do is refigure and reclaim uh, Jesus from this American project that has made Jesus white white capitalist uh, and anti everything that we are. So so like this, this first reclamation of Jesus uh, that has to happen. And then I think that there has to be this, uh, not a reliving of history, but really a, a, a recon, a, there has to be a type of conversance with history. At some point as black Christians, we have to decide whether we really want to perpetuate plantation religion or whether we want to perpetuate brush harbor spirituality, right? Because our ancestors came in into or, or, or reimagine the Christianity that they were given uh, in a way that was liberative. Freedom was on the mind of, of our ancestors when they could have been asleep, but they would rather go off into the clearings, into the woods, into the brush harbors in order to have ring shouts and other kinds of song, uh, musical engagement with God that affirm their personhood, that affirm their identity. And so we have to decide whether we are going to perpetuate this plantation religion that is deeply rooted in white supremacy or are we going to live out this bold abolitionist, bold brush harbor spirituality uh, that is rooted in freedom, right? So those are like two theological adjustments we have to make on the front end. And then, you know, I, I you know, I'm I'm in complete agreement is that this moment is a moment that belongs to, you know, uh, Dr. Dr. Brown talked about the priesthood of all believers. And, and I, I think companion to that, we have to talk about the prophethood of all believers, right? That we have to be clear uh, that, that there is prophetic power that lives in the street. And, and we have to figure out as, as congregations, as faith leaders, how we support, how we leverage our resources, leverage our physical plants, leverage our connections in halls of power to bolster what's happening on the streets organically. Uh, and lastly, I think in this moment, Black churches have to become very serious about what this judiciary looks like in this country, right? Uh, because what we have seen is that the judiciary, our courts, can be a noose on Black freedom or it can be a, a catapult uh, for, for Black freedom. And we have to have the same kind of, of passion, the same kind of energy, the same kind of awareness about how the courts can push our issues the same way white evangelicals do. White evangelicals have amassed and they've solidified around two policy agendas that they, you know, that they say the courts are worth fighting for. And I think that our issues need to be on the table when we talk about the courts. Anti-poverty, that we need to talk about 
about voting rights, that we need to put uh, 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 reparations and affirmative action on the table when we are talking about voting and not just who's at the top of the ticket or who or even who's in city council. But we have to expand our understanding of political power to be how do we now protect and mobilize the American judiciary to support the things we are interested in. Because the reason why the religious right are so powerful is not because of the people they send to Congress per se, not because of the people who are who's in the White House per se, but it's because they have been able to commandeer and monopolize the American courts for the last 40 years. That's right. That's right. And you know, not even for 40 years, I, I often look at, as I'm looking at CNN and, and, and news today, you can see how we were in slavery for all of these years because of the courts. You know, even when we got, even when we got our freedom from Lincoln, they took us right back because of the courts. You know, the, the courts brought right back Jim Crow, uh, um, uh, whether it's the, the prison system, uh, they just put a whole new thing, a, a whole new slavery in context because of uh, the courts. And I really uh, appreciate, uh, I appreciate your, your comments there. And uh, I want to talk some more about it, but I'm going to go down to Birmingham because uh, you brought up, what, what you brought up for me was I remember when, when we were, um, you know, I'm always, because I'm old school, I'm always going back and forth. But I remember just when we put black Jesus on the wall. You know, for those of us who put, when our parents put black Jesus on the wall, that was revolutionary. Uh, and then sometimes black folks wouldn't even come in your house if you had black Jesus on the wall. But, but you know, but we've come, we've come from somewhere from black Jesus on the wall to where we are now, which is a whole nother conversation. You know what I mean? And the, the, the power to, to take white Jesus off the wall and put black Jesus up on the wall was major. That was a major evolution for us. But now, where are we now? It's not about black Jesus being on the wall now. It's about changing a system. And I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Let's go down to Birmingham to my dear Dr. Brooks. You know, Willie, we, we, uh, last time I saw you, we was in the middle of the street of DC and you haven't aged then. Remember, Willie, we bumped into each other and I'm tired of you not aging. So we're gonna talk about blacks and aging, okay? I'm letting you know that right now um, up front. So here we are in this, this is the framework of, of where I'm gonna walk through. We are pandemic stricken, pandemic shocked. Our schools, our school children are undereducated and now pandemic pushed to the background. Our homeless population are demasked, don't have masks, and pandemic haven't even begun to hit them because they don't even know if they got it. So we, that's the pandemic framework. There's no conversation between the church, the community, and the language of what Christ and the Spirit is trying to say between the church and community now. Faith leaders are now the prophet's voice is now um, hushed by pandemic. Sunday mornings are now streamlined, video conference, and people are not listening because they're frying chicken, bacon, washing cars, and the word can't get to them. So that's another framework. And so now all this, this, and we're in the middle of a voting year between two white, white men who we have to pick from the lesser of the two evils, and we already know who we're trying to get in there. And so we have all this framework going on. And so now the theology of what is the spirit saying to, what is the language of the church to community? What is the, light, the language of the church in pandemic? What is the language of the church to the disenfranchised? What is the language of the church post? We are not prepared for the post because I don't even think we are even can see where post pandemic is. And we don't even have an answer for it because we don't have an answer for now. And so we are now in the middle of a problem, a bigger problem that exists. I'm not sure if the prophetic voice of the church even understands it because we're still asleep. We haven't even woken up. And I don't even think many churches are prepared to wake up because they are now social media <laughs> problematic. We spend more time trying to figure out Zooms, social media, and all those problems that existed prior to before pandemic it's gonna creep back up onto us again. So we're gonna still be in a bigger problem. Now we have school systems opening with children that have to go back into a system 
that is already a problem for them, stay at home with all the mental illnesses of that time. You know, we have children that now have to stay home with their abusers, have to live in houses with their abusers, and now we still have to come back and deal with the health problem with that. So what is this, how do we unpack all of this? I think that I, the, the language of what the church says to community is what's gonna matter. Hmm. And, and being able to understand what is the Christ, what is Christ saying in the midst of all of this? What is the spirit saying? And we have to engage the community to understand where the community is coming from and what the community needs and what the community, when I'm a big community person and our communities are so disenfranchised that there's no conversation between the church even going on. There is no type of, um, how can I put this? There's a distrust between community and the church. There's a distrust between the church and community. So how then can we exist with, with all this distrust and no conversation? And so it's like we're at burnout point. And it's like our languages is burnt out. Our conversation is burnt out. Our discussions are burnt out. And, and now we're asking for some type of, where is God in all of this? Well, God is in all of it, but we have to reclaim a language that says, hey, we have to stand up for our communities. We have to stand up for our children, our seniors. Um, guess what? Pandemic is now taking over Cancer Month. Mm. Cancer screenings are not going on as, well, as much as possible. All because of a government who refused to see that the pandemic was even real. But it pushes African Americans back. It pushes us back. And we're now, we, we are now years back. Here's my problem. Here's the thing that a lot of people are not talking about that I'm afraid of. It's going to push our um, seniors back. It's going to push high school seniors from getting into college. Now it's going to push them from being able to take certain um, tests. It's going to it's, so now we are now moving backwards even in the educational sphere when it deals with African American children. We haven't even touched the brim of that. So when you talk about um, who's at the forefront, we are at the forefront, but we're trying to figure out what front to go to. <laughs> we're just trying to find, do we stand on the front of pandemic? Are we standing on the front of healthcare? Are we standing on the front of um, uh, um, the judiciary system about this big plot that's coming up that, we're, that you can probably hear on my TV about Amy Kel Comey Barrett? Uh, where are we going? See, the evangelicals are clear on their two points. They're clear on where they're trying to go. We have no clarity on where we're trying to go. We're all over the place. The black church is so much all over the place. Now we're fighting to see who's going to be the first one zooming. Is that what Christ went to the church for? I mean, to the cross for. Social media is now, we fought for two weeks who's going to open up a church and who's not going to open up a church. Now we're not even thinking about minding your own business and, and working within your own communities. We're fighting each other about certain things. There's a war between us that we have to stop. There's a war between the church and community and the black church that has to stop before we find a common ground. There's no common ground right now, but the evangelicals are clear on that common ground. They are very clear where they're trying to go. And so if you ask me, what is Christ, what is the language that we must have? We have to have a language um, of forgiveness, a radical forgiveness of, of each other before we try to get on common ground. I don't think we've forgiven each other. I don't even think we trust each other. I think that major ministry is going, I think the major ministries that we have seen all over this country is going to have to reclaim a different language. Because if we're going back to 18 people being on a flyer, preaching down walls and the community is not being safe, people don't trust that anymore. People want to know, what can you do for me and my community? And then the report that just came out that 70 million people could lose their jobs as this stimulus check or 70 will be un with no unemployment. Well, that's coming into the holiday season. It's going to affect the black church. It's going to affect black communities, black kids. We're, we're, now we got, we got to figure out what, where we're going to stand at in all of this. Social justice is good. I'm a social justice person. We're going to fight and stand up. Dr. Willie, he's a social justice person. He's, I love it. But what forefront are we standing on? 
And where do we go from here? There's got to be a language that we have to produce that's better than where we are. I'm not disgusted. I'm just a little upset that for half of May and April, we argued about who's the better prophet for opening and not opening a church in May. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was um, all of that. So uh, each of you have talked about where we need to go and have uh, begun to unpack a lot of um, the, you know, the language, reclaiming Jesus, how do we do this? And of course, time is moving. So I'm going to, you know, ask us to go around and give us a, a two points of a two point solution. You know, uh, you have um, uh, the church is not, we, we know the black church is not a monolithic voice. We are all of it. I tell folks I can meet Jesus however Jesus comes because I work with all kinds of Jesus churches. They are definitely not the same. They may be talking from the same Bible, but they are not the same. So let's talk about each of you. Just lift up two solutions on this is what we, this is not the big picture, but just some programmatic step, a step. Talk to me, tell me what I need to do. You're talking to the, 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 new, the, the new leadership and you're talking to the old leadership. Where, because it's all one, it's all the black church. I work with the urban, I work with the rural. I work with the old God, I work with the young God. Give us a solution on how we come together to tackle this crisis that we're in today. I'm gonna to go back to my sister, Dr. Brown. So I think uh, one, uh, leadership development is, is key. Um, and here's why. Uh, like I said, that, that it may not always be the, the senior pastor or the faith leader out front. We've got to begin to develop leaders who can be planted into these systems, who can go to these systems. Case in point, um, in, in my city, there, there was an issue with our school system. And after I got finished or got tired, of asking school board members to make change, right? Or, or to adjust or address certain things and they weren't, I decided to run myself. And so now I'm sitting at the table, which means that there's a little more influence that I have sitting at the table than I did going to board meetings, <laughs> expressing my concerns, mm -hmm. right? Um, we've made sure that our district employs a restorative justice model. Um, the education system is one of the first institutions, first systems that our young people are encountering. And, and so it's not always the, the justice system, but they are being disproportionately expelled, disproportionately like disciplined in, in ways that are detrimental, right, to the way that they see themselves in the future, the way that they engage the world in the future, and it's happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And, and kids start school at three, four, five. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so developing leaders from within our churches who have the understanding that you cannot separate scripture and justice. You are in error if you are separating the two, the, the, the two because at the heart of scripture it is justice, right? There, there's never a time when scripture is not talking about just Old Testament, New Testament. Look, we can fight over whether to tithe, don't tithe, but you cannot you have no argument about right. whether or not, right, uh, uh, justice is a full Bible situation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so developing leaders who can run for office, developing leaders who can speak truth to power from the table, right. right, and who are part of those decision-making things. And I, I think we've got to start it early, right, that, that our teenagers, that, that our, our Generation Z, we've got to pay more attention to them and begin to um, get behind them, prepare them, leadership development, and then get behind them. The other thing is uh, revisiting the power of the local church. Mm -hmm. See, uh, we, we had a statesman pass away a few months ago in the state of New Jersey, Dr. Henry P. Davis. And I was having a conversation with a friend who is my peer in terms of age, who is new to the state of New Jersey, pastoring in the, in the state. And, and when Dr. Davis died, the friend said to me, well, I thought that his church, because of right, his reputation, that his church would have been bigger. I said, well, Dr. Davis represents a generation who gained respect based on their work in the community, 
the, the paradigm has shifted and, and we gain respect by the size of our church. That's right. That's right. The problem is the people up the street don't always know who we are. Mm -hmm. And so beyond soup kitchens, beyond food pantries, we've got to revisit the work of the local church. If you have the finger on the pulse of what is happening in the place where your church has been planted, right? And, and the needs of the black people, there are some things that are broad stroke black issues, but we're, all, we're not a monolith, right? And so there are black people in Pleasantville, there are black people in Perth Amboy. We're both in New Jersey, uh, Dr. Francois and I, but the needs may be different. But if we have the finger on the pulse of the deeds in our local community, and we are addressing those, then I think that from the ground up, change begins to happen. And so as faith leaders, we've got to focus on leadership development that is not just raising up ministers and deacons in your own church, but how do we raise up folks who will raise hell when it comes to, pardon my, I'm sorry, I said hell, but who will raise hell. It's all right, it's <laughs> and, all right. And, and at tables and run for city council and in some of those lower positions on the ballot. It, it's not just the, the president, right? But school boards, how, how, how are we explaining uh, legalization of marijuana is on the ballot in New Jersey, right? How are we explaining these things? to our people and, and then get our, stop clutching our pearls on certain things and, and also consider the bigger picture and, and some things that, that could be a benefit to the folks and <laughs> answer some of the issues that, that we are experiencing. So leadership development and then having a finger on the pulse of the people in your local community, revisit the power of the local church because she is powerful. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. I'm going to go to um, Dr. Brooks. Come on in here, and then we'll send it over to uh, Dr. Swanson. So, so I think that um, we definitely agree with Dr. Brown. Um, I think that there must be a step up of us preparing for political leadership. We know what it means like to have leadership in the church, but we have to change. I'm not sure are in his in his maybe a problem that a lot of people have a problem with me of i'm not sure if all black cities need all black leadership mm. i'm just not sure because we've seen the breakdown of what it happened here in birmingham for almost 20 something years all black leadership across the board school system still failing poverty still at a rise in the mothership of the civil rights movement we are behind in the entire country. The mothership, the Mecca, the grooming yard for social justice in this country to fight in the civil rights movement is behind Shuttlesworth, King, major political figures. And therefore we constantly continue to say we need blacks across the board. We probably do but we probably need Blacks that are woke and understand how to make things happen. So we definitely need to step up for political leadership. Two, the church, there must be a serious passing of the mantle and understanding what the next generation of prophet and preacher has to offer and need to the backing of the before generation. There's always a pushback. One of the things that I'm so... I get furiated when churches send out announcements. We're looking for a younger pastor. No, you're not. You're really not. You're not looking for a younger pastor. You're not. I need you to put that lie back into the pit of hell, use Caesar's signet ring, and put it behind the tomb because you're not looking for a younger pastor. You want the notoriety, you want the connections, and you want the energy of the younger pastor, but you don't want the change, you don't want the, the, the level of dive of theological influence of the younger pastor. They don't want the younger pastor. They want the old pastor, but they want him to have the, the energy of the new pastor. <laughs> so there's a problem there, you understand? I'm saying it, I'm feeling it, and I know it firsthand. I'm sitting, I sat in the second chariot, and the first chariot now. They don't want younger pastors. Now, if there's not an honesty that's coming from the church to what they want for their prophetic chair, there's not an honesty the community can accept because we're not being honest with ourselves. Paneling on walls. 
systems of oppression inside the church. Women being misogyny was inside the church. People don't want to see that anymore. The day is over. If you can't accept the woman preaching, something is wrong with you. Something is wrong. And so if people, if the community is tired of the church, and the church don't know as tied as the church, and we got all these black ram boys, there has to be a changing of God somewhere. There has to be. Then here's probably one of my most radical things that I get hit on all over the country. We have to find ways to get at tables with other, other cultures. We have to learn the language of talking with other cultures. If there are churches that are not of our skin color, that's more, that's more prone to support us, we have to come to the table and figure out how can we gain support and resources for our communities without compromising our blackness. I don't even know if it's compromising our blackness. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to learn to get at the table and know how to talk. We don't have a lot of people that's coming to the table and know how to talk. You can't come to a table where and 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 and, and and try to have conversations about resources with other churches and, and other denominations and other skin colors. And the only thing you can talk about is Jim Crow. You have to expand your thinking. You have to expand your wisdom. You have to, you, what made King and, and, and everybody effective, they can talk across the board on so much. We only can talk one way and it turns people off. It's almost theological ignorance being able to just talk one way. And, and, and it goes against Jesus of Nazareth. It goes against Jesus' whole conversation. So this is what part of my dissertation. Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well, Nicodemus Zach, and, and Zacchaeus, they were three distinct conversations that we preach about. He never mixed the three people up. He was very concerned with those three persons problem he was very concerned that he was that that the movement of the kingdom would come to them he was understanding of them the conversations never mixed we have to get to the 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 the, the table and not have conversations mixed but stay straight to the point what are you there for what do you want what do you want to walk away with i know people may get upset with me but i love the fact what oprah does if she wants to make a deal, she sends her people before her because they understand her language, understands her contract, and understand what she wants. We don't have that. We get to the table and we all over the place and wonder why resources can't come. All and right. so that's a problem. All right. All right. Dr. Francois, I'm going to give you the last word on this one. Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, th thanks, Dr. Uh, Brooks, for, for setting that up uh, in, in that way. I think it's important. Uh, to know that a church can never take a society where it's not willing to go internally, right? Uh, and there, there's, there's a disconnect between how many churches claim to be invested in social justice, but there's deep inequities that exist within them, right? Within their, their, their structures, within their ranks. And I think that part of what the church has to do is the church ha churches have to figure out how to be internally equitable in order for them to really have the kind of, of legitimacy, the kind of reputation, the kind of public gravitas necessary to shift communities, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to, to see how churches can be really invested in social justice when they are anti-woman, when they are anti-gay, uh, and many of our middle class churches are, are, are anti-poor, even as anti-poor people, even as we do anti-poverty work. And so I think we have to do one of the first shifts is how do we revolutionize and transform our internal culture? How do we transform our institutions so that they actually model the kind of world we say we're fighting for in the streets? Uh, an another factor I think is, is important is figuring out uh, how, how do we turn churches into incubators of liberation, incubators of, of revolution? I love uh, that, that uh, Dr. Brown was, was really setting up this idea of the church being a kind of political pipeline where we are grooming, forming, and nurturing new leaders to inject into uh, the flow of political power, the flow of, of economic power. And, that, and part of that has to be connected to uh, when, when we think about our education system, which, you know, is, you know, that, that's the bedrock system. We live in a country uh, where, you know, 
70% of folk are not going to go past 12th grade, right? We live in a high school nation. That's what it is. And so it's really the education system is the only uh, enduring system we have to really shape people who are going to participate in society, participate in our democracy, participate in our economy. And I think what we have to do there is that we have to help families build power. I think that's part of what churches should be interested in, is helping families build power. And how do we mobilize these parents to really have an impact on what local education looks like? I think churches are uniquely poised uh, to do that kind of work. Uh, so in addition to, to, to the church creating uh, its own own political advocates, its own uh, political uh, personalities, the church has to also be interested, how do we impact the local, the local education system by helping families build power, by mobilizing parents uh, to advocate for themselves, to advocate for their children, and really start to cast a political vision for what local schools uh, should look like. So churches can do that, that kind of work. And figuring out, and, and lastly, I know you said that said too, but, but the last thing is how how does the church, as an incubator of liberation, how does the church really take seriously uh, uh, policy advocacy, right? Uh, I think that many of our churches lack contextual intelligence. Uh, we, we sort of run with this cookie cutter approach to what will change our societies without actually doing a reading of what our communities need. Contextual intelligence right. is going to be really important for what kind of policies are necessary to transform uh, our, our communities. And, he, and here's the, here is where we must go. We have to figure out how to advocate for policies and engage people with positions uh, of power uh, online and offline. We have to figure out how do we now these tools that we're all living in, Zoom, uh, uh, Facebook, you know, what social media, whatever we're using to stream worship, we have to now also use uh, to do public policy advocacy and realize that our role now is for the rest of our lives is gonna be online, offline. We have to figure out how to advocate in person, but also how to uh, galvanize the technological advancements, the technological competencies that we all have now because of COVID-19 and use that uh, to push for a political vision, to use that to engage governors and mayors and, and judges and, and and, 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 and you know, legislators on, on all the levels, right? So we have to use now our newfound awareness of technology to push forward social justice agendas because guess what? Email still does work, right? Uh, what, what happens? You can send mass text messages all over your community about registering to vote and helping people fill out the census. So now how do we become uh, uh, communities of advocates that are using online, offline uh, dynamics to push forward the kind of agenda that we want in education, uh, in, in gender equity, in wage equity, in closing, and one thing that we don't talk about often, and that is closing the racial wealth gap and the gender wealth gap in this country. How do we as churches in online and offline ways uh, begin to shift that narrative and make our voices heard and and, and, and lastly, as a part of this, we got to be clear about this, is that uh, where, where, uh, where uh, Dr. Brooks is in Alabama, we have seen, it's been, it's been 50 years, but we have seen how divestment can shift the country. We have to start having some serious conversations on how we can use economic boycotts to push our agenda forward again. And that requires contextual intelligence. It requires us realizing what kind of spending should we stop that will get the attention of people with power uh, so that they know that we are actually more serious about this than we have been in the past 40 years. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much. Mm. Uh, and I hope that you all, we have to go. Time has run out. And I hope that you have learned uh, as much as I have and have enjoyed this robust conversation. I want to thank Dr. Willie Francois and Dr. Brooks and Dr. Brown for sharing their, their, their thoughts, their expertise, their leadership. Uh, and I look forward to more conversations uh, like this. To USCHA, I hope you have enjoyed this conversation. And I am, I am Dr. Pernessa Seal, the founder and the CEO of The Bomb in Gilead. Thank you so much, and we will see you soon.